Well, special and warm greetings to you all at Castlehold Baptist Church in Newport. I think of the Isle of Wight very often and remember you in my prayers, given that I live just across the water in Barton-on-Sea and see the Needles and West White most days from the clifftop here. Sorry not to be able to be with you face to face, that would have been great, but uh, thank you anyway for allowing me to be part of your worship today. It has become commonplace to be using the word bubble in a way that we wouldn't normally be doing. There's a social bubble, there could be a workplace bubble, there may well be an educational class bubble. There's almost certainly likely to be a household bubble. You may be watching this from a household bubble right now. And although it sounds really quite frothy and lively and fun, it's actually quite the reverse of that. It's very serious and difficult and it's about being restricted from having the face-to-face -face contact with those that we work with, we want to be with, that we want to freely mix with, those that we love and care about. And it represents the, all this talk, an ache that we have for those ways that we've been so used to that are just part of being human, of being able to mix and be together in the ways that we choose. An ache. You might even call it a groan. And certainly in Romans 8, one of the passages that we're thinking about today, the language that the Apostle Paul uses is the language of groan. But within the same passage, he talks about glory and indeed living gloriously. So how do these things, how can these things go together? How can someone like Paul, used to suffering and struggle himself and imprisonment, addressing people that are uh, under the shadow of persecution and hostility, how can he imply or suggest that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us? All I would say is I'm prepared to listen to someone who himself experienced personal lockdown and restriction and is trying to encourage and support those who are facing their own restrictions and opposition. So an ache that we feel and uh, a groaning for things as they should be, being able to be thoroughly, properly human. This understanding of what it means to be human is so important and uh, a lot of the time, we may not have said it out loud, but a lot of the time we're thinking this just isn't how we're meant to be. <laughs> this isn't how we're meant to function and we long for the day when a vaccine will be present and available. So the Apostle Paul talks about this ache and he says that it's an ache that creation itself, all of it, also feels. It's a, a longing that creation feels. Uh, but from the part of the wider natural world, the animals, the mountains, the seas, the stars, the plants and so on, their longing is about human beings finally living up to what we're meant to be, to live glorious. So in this same passage, Paul talks about how the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed, for women and men and children and young people finally to image God and to engage with creation as we were always meant to, to take care of it and to help it to flourish. And in that way, then creation itself, instead of sensing that there's always a struggle and always a bad news story, is liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. It's all of a whole, this uh, integrated, holistic understanding of God's great purposes for his planet with human beings playing their role. And of course, there are echoes here of one of my favourite psalms, Psalm 8. And in Psalm 8, it celebrates the glory of God, which we see reflected in the heavens and the moon and the stars and all that God has created through his hands. It also celebrates the possibility of those that see that and see God's glory and want to respond to it, and then others who are oblivious to it, almost like they're asleep. 
and interestingly enough, it's children and young people that the psalmist particularly senses get who God is as opposed to those that are opposed to God and what it means to flourish as humans. You've made sure that children and infants praise you. Their praise is a wall that stops the talk of your enemies, the fake news about what it means to be human or what we must have in society and all those proper and good questions that we've been asking over the last four months or so. Praise. Praise is simply understanding and celebrating and naming out loud something which is true of God. Children and young people getting it. Jesus said children and young people get it when there was a complaint that they were actually celebrating his arrival into Jerusalem. Jesus thought a lot of this sentence and this psalm, it seems. Not very long ago, my wife and I, Alison, we were able to see our daughter and son-in-law and our granddaughter. We were able to be socially distant under a gazebo in the garden to celebrate Poppy's first birthday. And as you do, she had some presents for her, which mum and dad had to help her open. And instead of being fascinated by the gift wrap, which apparently is what they're supposed to do, uh, Poppy was fascinated by the gift tag and the cards. And she got her tiny little fingers and just tried to prise open the gift tag to look inside and the, and the birthday card to look inside. And the reason why she does it is because she's learned quite early on that something that looks like a book has a treasure trove inside it. And so when she looks inside a book, there's an animal that uh, makes a noise if you press it or whoever's reading it with you makes the noise with you. Uh, there's a song to be sung. There's perhaps even a dance to be danced so that every time a page is turned into one of her in one of her hardboard books, um, for her, it's a, it's a sheer joy and it's a shared joy because she's doing it with others. And if she ever gets hold of a hardboard book now by herself, if no one else is there and she just wants to sort of look at it and uh, open it bit by bit as she can, she hums to herself because for her, books are about life and vitality. It's lovely, isn't it? The naivety uh, and uh, also the development of uh, a young child, a young baby and the way that they grow. But she is not familiar with or complacent about books, about life. Um, she's intrigued. She's awake to it. And as well as the ache that we feel and the groaning that we feel, there's the need to be awake. And uh, in Psalm 8, there is this sense of being awake. And what we need to be awake to is the human vocation to which we're called by God. Our vocation, all of us, whatever our situation, whatever's going on in human society and the wider world. So the, the psalmist is well known for celebrating and being astonished at, awake to, this glorious God with this amazing world and environment and natural creation that's there. And then asking the question, what are human beings that you notice them? What are mortals that you care for them? You've made them a little lower than the angels. You've placed on them a, a crown of glory and honour. There's something that uh, this the psalmist, uh, whether it's David or not, uh, couldn't get over. God's care, given God's greatness and creativity for human beings, God's noticing of human beings. God notices us. What's interesting is that the Apostle Paul takes some of this idea, which of course also connects to Genesis 1 and being made in the image of God and called to care for creation. And he applies it a bit further, uh, talking about us being children who are supposed to be glorious. And he talks about how uh, God is wanting to call us to be more and more fulfilling the human vocation that we have and to live gloriously. And that includes coming alongside others who need to know and understand God's care and invitation and love and good, strong purposes for every human being. 
Verse 28, well known, we know that in all things God works together with those who love him to bring about what is good, with those who have been called according to his purpose. God works together with those who love him to bring about what is good. Tom Wright is the one who translates this particular verse in this way, and uh, I get it, I agree with him. Tom Wright is one of the most uh, um, well-known evangelical scholars um, uh, uh, worldwide. God works together with those who love him to bring about what is good, with those who have been called according to his purpose. And the good thing particularly is that we are to be conformed to the image of his son Jesus, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So when we ask, what is the good that God is about? Well, for everybody, it's that they might grow up into the human beings they're meant to, to flourish. And uh, that means to image all that we discover about God and humanity in Jesus himself. It's a huge calling. And it means that every human being is loved and crowned with glory and honour, even though, as Romans 3 uh, also says, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory. Apostle Paul's wanting to say the glory gets restored by the Spirit, bit by bit. And the particular task and vocation that we have is clearly named, it just hinted at in Romans 8, it's clearly named in Psalm 8. You made them a little lower than the angels, you placed on them a crown of glory and honour, you made human beings rule over everything your hands created, you put everything under their control. Here's this reaffirmation of the calling for each one of us. And the the crucial thing to notice is this. All human beings are noticed by God. All mortals are cared for by God. All human beings are a little lower than the angels and crowned with glory and honour. All human beings are called to exercise management and leadership and influence in caring for the created world, and helping other human beings also to flourish. All lives matter. And when we discover that any group within all humanity, all lives, is being marginalised or abused or systematically set aside or put at risk or not given the same opportunities, at that point we do need to say and name that those people particularly need to be We need to have our attention drawn to what we should do about that. We are being remade. There's an ache, there's a coming awake, there's also a remake. And it's a remaking, which means that we're called to make sure that the whole environment, but also all human beings flourish. So when we say black lives matter, we're not saying other lives don't matter. We're saying here are a a, a group of people who actually uh, their treatment and the position that they've been put in is so bad, so poor, and we've taken such a long time to actually do anything about it that we must draw attention to it. At other times, we've had other other strap lines, actually. One of the big strap lines in education for some years was every child matters. And given that my wife is involved in special needs education, you know, I feel passionate about that. Every child matters and should have opportunity. And we need to devote resources to helping them to flourish in all the ways that they can. So, a time, even though it's difficult, and we we won't play down how difficult this is, how weary we are, how much of a longing and ache we feel for a return to at least some of the things that are so good about the freedoms we normally enjoy. We won't play it down. The Apostle Paul doesn't play down the struggle. Psalm 8 doesn't minimise the fact that there are people that are enemies and hostile to the ways of God. But we do realise that perhaps now, above all times, is a time to awake to the bigger story of what God is doing and what God still invites us into. And it's a awaking to the remaking of God, of each human being being able to flourish. And that means that, as we've noticed so strongly, those that normally we would overlook or take for granted or pay poorly or not appreciate, those people particularly, our attention is drawn back to them as, those, as well as those who are actually mistreated 
and treated badly in any respect. So here's something that God is doing, bit by bit, one person by one person. A call to live glorious, to be glorious, as well as to exercise humility that we're not there yet and we need the Spirit's help. I'm reminded of a story of uh, a dad who is on his own with his two young sons on a very, very rainy day. And he couldn't think of anything else to do or to offer them, uh, but finally had a, a bright idea. Finally had a bright idea. And his idea was this. He remembered that he'd seen in a magazine uh, a picture of the world. And he got a pair of scissors, cut the picture up into as many tiny pieces as he could, and effectively created a homemade jigsaw. He then shuffled it all up, put it on a table in the lounge, and said to his two, two, two boys, um, OK, if you, if you sort of try and put this back together again, uh, it's a picture of the world, put it back together again, and um, I'm just going to make a cup of tea and get you a drink as well. So he went into the kitchen. The kettle had only just finished boiling, and one of the boys said, Dad, we finished it. And he was uh, both shocked and disappointed that they'd been so quick. Um, he was hoping for a bit of a break. When he came back in, there it was, perfect, perfect picture of the world. They put it all together beautifully. And he said to them, how is it that you managed to do it so quickly? I thought it would be a bit more difficult for, than this. I didn't realise your geography was so good. Uh, or anything like that. And they said, well, Dad, um, what we discovered was that on the back there was a picture of a person. And when we put the person back together, the world came together as well. And so we're told by the Apostle Paul in Romans that the Spirit helps us with that ache, that groaning, that longing, and takes it, even though it's inarticulate, takes it to God. God understanding what that ache and that prayer means as the Spirit brings it. And then God answering it in us. In us, particularly, fleshed out in the church, the body of Christ. And so we finish with an American folk hymn which captures something of the vision and the longing of God's vocation being fulfilled in us and through us to the blessing of all people. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live, a place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith and vault of grace, here the love of Christ shall end divisions, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where prophets speak and words are strong and true, where all God's children dare to seek, to dream God's reign anew. Here the cross shall stand as witness and a symbol of God's grace. Here as one we claim the faith of Jesus, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where love is found in water, wine and wheat, a banquet hall on holy ground where peace and justice meet. Here the love of God through Jesus is revealed in time and space as we share in Christ the feast that frees us. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. By the grace of God, as the Holy Spirit works, may this be so. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.